Well, hello everyone. My name is LJ Stambuk. I'm the President CEO of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. We have a wonderful program today, very informative. I would like to introduce to you, and let's start with our slide. In a moment, I would like to introduce you Ambassador Craig Allen, who is the President of the US-China Business Council. Thank you, Ambassador Craig, to be, um, being with us today. Uh, the annual China Town Hall connects leading China experts with Americans around the country for national conversation on the implications of China's rise on U.S.-China relations and its impact on our towns, states, and nation. The National Committee is proud to partner with a range of institutions and community groups, colleges and universities, trade and business associations, and the World Affairs Councils of America to bring this important national conversation to local communities around America for the 14th consecutive year. The 2020 China Hall, Town Hall events are the following. Uh, we have a program with Ray Dalio tonight at 7 p.m. Then we have the China Town Hall on Society and Culture, which is gonna be on Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m. with Raymond Chang, Lucas Sin, and Janet Yang. Then we will have the China Town Hall U.S. Perspectives in Chinese on Monday, November the 16th at 8 a.m. Robert Daly, June May, and Matt Sheehan. And then we'll have the China Town Hall Economics and Trade on the Tuesday, November 17th at 7 p.m. with Amy Kelko, Huang Yiping, and Andy Rotman. And finally, the China Town Hall on Health and Climate. That will be interesting. Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. Margaret Amberg, Ryan Pass, and Angel Su. As the community's premier global education nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, World Affairs Council of Charlotte has always sought to bring the world closer to you and to build a community of internationally informed and engaged citizens. Dialogue, knowledge, active participation, and an understanding of global issues are vitally important for our democracy to flourish at all levels. Couple of housekeeping rules your microphone will be on mute and your camera turned off for the duration of the presentation. Please note this, to submit a question anytime, use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. You can see it circled in red. Please note that this presentation will be recorded and sent out via the World Affairs Council Charlotte mailing list. So please make sure you sign up to receive our emails. If you enjoy this free program, please consider making a tax deductible donation to help support our international education mission in these challenging times. Thank you. The benefits of the World Affairs Council are discounts or free admissions to World Affairs Council programs, recognition or contribution on the World Affairs Council website, access to private receptions and book signings by world-renowned experts on global issues, complimentary subscription to the Daily Chatter, a nonpartisan international daily newsletter, special discounts for The Economist, Foreign Policy, The New Yorker, and other leading publications, customized international travel opportunities specifically designed for World Affairs Council Charlotte members, and you support local students and educators. So please do consider becoming a World Affairs Council Charlotte member, and we would thank you for that. Upcoming programs in December, on Tuesday, December 8th, at 2 p.m., we have the World Affairs Council Distinguished Speaker Series with John Williams, who is the CEO of Domtar, a global paper and forestry com company. And on Wednesday, December 16th at 2 p.m., we have the World Affairs Council Distinguished Speaker Panel with Jean Woods, the CEO of Atrium Health, and Dr. Julie A. Freschlag. She's the CEO of Wake Forest Baptist Health and Dean of Wake Forest School of Medicine. Please do join us. If you like us, please follow us, share on social media. It is my pleasure once again to introduce to you Ambassador Craig Allen. In July 2018, Ambassador Allen began his tenure in Washington DC as the sixth president of the United States China Business Council, a private, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization representing over 200 American companies doing business with China. Prior to joining USCBC, Craig had a long and distinguished career in U.S. public service. Ambassador Allen began his government career in 1985 at the Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration, and he also served at the American Institute in Taiwan and the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. 
In 2000, Ambassador Allen served a two-year tour at the National Center for EPIC in Seattle. While there, he worked on the EPIC summits in Brunei, China, and Mexico. In 2002, it was back to China where Ambassador Allen served as the senior commercial officer. In Beijing, Ambassador Allen was promoted to the Minister Council rank of the Senior Foreign Service. After a four-year tour in South Africa, Craig became Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia at the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration. He later became Deputy Assistant Secretary for China. Ambassador Allen was sworn in as the United States Ambassador to Brunei Darussalam on December 19, 2014. He served there until July 2018 when he transitioned to President of the U.S.-China Business Council. Ambassador Allen received a BA from the University of Michigan in Political Science and Asian Studies in 1979. He received a Master of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University in 1985. It is my pleasure and distinct honor to introduce to you Ambassador Craig Allen. Ambassador, please. Well, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. I'm uh, grateful to you, uh, LJ, and I'm grateful to Jesse and grateful <clears throat> to the World Affairs Council of Charlotte uh, for hosting this uh, event uh, this evening. Uh, I, uh, am, uh, I, I regret uh, that we are not able to get together personally, <clears throat> but I think that we're going to have a really good session, uh, especially uh, looking forward to Ray Dalio's uh, remarks uh, at seven o'clock this evening. And I'm sure that he'll give us a big macro perspective and I'm betting that he'll give us a look into the future. So uh, I think it's uh, my job uh, to talk about uh, North Carolina and uh, the China-North Carolina relationship, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, the overall economic uh, trade and investment relationship uh, between uh, the United States and China as it currently stands. We are probably in a transition mode one way or the other, um, uh, but uh, I think that there will be a lot of continuity uh, within the next administration, um, and uh, there is a lot uh, to talk about. So before I begin, uh, I would like to just take a second to acknowledge uh, a, a painful truth, uh, and that is uh, U.S.-China economic relations have not always been easy uh, for uh, the great state of North Carolina. I can recall, and I uh, am betting that many of you can recall, uh, the challenges that China trade uh, brought to the North Carolina furniture industry, uh, the apparel industry, the textile industry, uh, and the tobacco industry, and probably more. I recall uh, when I was a young uh, uh, officer uh, diplomat uh, in China about hearing about factories in China uh, 10 times larger uh, than the factories in North Carolina, but turning out furniture uh, that uh, it was of the North Carolina uh, style um, driving uh, North Carolina firms uh, out of business. Many of these firms, uh, these Chinese invested firms, were owned by Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, or Korean uh, companies, but their combination of, uh, of very large scale uh, productivity and low wages and a lack of environmental or labor uh, protection was devastating on the North Carolina, on that part of the North Carolina economy. Now, the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce, where I worked, uh, did hit back uh, with high tariffs uh, against those products that we felt were being produced uh, with subsidies uh, or under uh, market prices. And in my view, the uh, state of North Carolina did a, a, a very good job at uh, trying to recruit uh, Japanese and foreign investment uh, into North Carolina to replace some of those jobs. But uh, the fact is that many North Carolinans uh, were hard hit. Many lost their jobs. Uh, many were not able to re retain uh, new jobs or find uh, new employment. And I deeply regret that suffering. 
so I think that acknowledging this uh, pain, in, in some cases still ongoing, is appropriate uh, as uh, we begin to talk about the current state of uh, uh, North Carolina uh, and China trade. Uh, so with that, Jesse, uh, if you could uh, please uh, put on uh, the PowerPoint. I'd like to ground us uh, in our discussion today uh, with uh, uh, some numbers, not many, uh, but uh, to illustrate how important uh, North Carolina, uh, how important China is to North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this will show you um, the total goods exports uh, from North Carolina uh, to uh, China. And as you can see, uh, there it, it's, it's quite healthy. Um, and North Carolina, I hasten to say, is doing a better job uh, than, than the rest of the country or on average. On average, uh, from 2017 to 2019, U.S. exports uh, declined 17 percent. Um, but in the case of North Carolina, uh, you really outpace that. Your exports to China uh, increased 30 percent. And uh, so I think that that is uh, an interesting statistic. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, your top uh, overseas markets, China clocks in at number three uh, in uh, uh, last year uh, with $34 billion. Uh, I could see it overtaking Mexico uh, in the not, dear, uh, not distant future, but will probably remain behind Canada. Now, when you look at the bottom part of the slide, at the uh, what are what products are being exported to China, um, you see a, a predominantly uh, pharmaceuticals and medicines, and uh, I think that that's uh, interesting, and I suspect that that uh, pharmaceuticals and medicines uh, are behind uh, the major uh, increase in uh, North Carolina exports that we saw in 2019. And uh, I think that that's something to be celebrated. Meat products are very large. I, I think that there's tremendous opportunities uh, in the hog uh, industry in particular. Pulp and paper uh, and wood uh, products are important. Semiconductors and, and components. And agriculture uh, in general could do very well in the China market. And I expect a lot of growth there in 2021, and I, help, uh, I hope uh, beyond that. So let's go to the next slide, please. It's important to remember that exports are not only things that you can drop on your feet, uh, but a Chinese student studying at Duke or UNC is an export. A Chinese traveler uh, going through your beautiful, the beautiful state of North Carolina in the mountains or on the, uh, on the beaches, that's an export. Um, and uh, your service exports uh, to China have done very well. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of room here for uh, also for increases. Uh, so let's, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, China is your fifth largest services export market. Um, and I'm certain will overtake um, uh, a few of the others uh, in the not distant future. Um, when you look at uh, the bottom part of this uh, slide, uh, travel is uh, important, and uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of stories there. Uh, that's probably mostly tourism, but also uh, conventions and meetings and corporate and, and other things. Royalties, I think, is also very interesting and important. That's uh, intellectual property rights that North Carolinians hold, um, for which royalties are being paid, and we'll talk more about IPR later. Uh, education, very important. You've got great schools in North Carolina, uh, and, and here uh, you see uh, the benefits uh, uh, from that. A lot of financial services companies uh, headquartered in North Carolina, a lot of good revenue there, and, and then uh, uh, passenger traffic. Next slide, please. So altogether, um, some 24,000 uh, jobs, we estimate, uh, come from uh, uh, North Carolina exports uh, to China. Now, that's direct jobs. 
Um, this number does not include North Carolina uh, investments by Chinese companies, which would employ, uh, I'm guessing, uh, I, I don't know, uh, a couple of thousand uh, North Carolinians. Uh, it also doesn't include uh, indirect uh, benefits, uh, such as um, uh, the lower cost of, uh, uh, of goods and a vibrant uh, retail sector. Uh, sector. But 24,100 is a good foundational number uh, which we could go upon. And I hope uh, anyway that that uh, helps to set kind of an analytical framework uh, as to how important uh, China is uh, to uh, the state. So uh, that's uh, kind of the end of my slideshow. Um, so I would like to um, spend um, ah, you know, the next uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, talking about uh, U.S.-China trade relations, where we are now, um, uh, how did we get here, uh, and also uh, what we could expect in a, a post-transition um, uh, time frame, uh, some uh, 10 weeks from now, uh, after uh, a new administration. And I'm not going to uh, venture to say which uh, administration that'll be, uh, but I think that the fundamental facts uh, will remain the same, be that a Biden and a tr or, or a Trump administration. Um, so um, let uh, uh, me uh, start out uh, with uh, the beginning of the Trump administration when uh, the, uh, the president um, who had often spoken about the very large trade imbalances uh, between China and the U.S., uh, really initiated uh, his trade action against China by um, ordering uh, the United States trade representative uh, to come up with uh, a uh, report uh, that we call the 301 report. Uh, the 301 is just an article in U.S. trade law that uh, allows, uh, under U.S. trade law, uh, the USTR or the Department of Commerce to impose tariffs uh, if uh, a foreign trading partner is not trading uh, fairly. Now, I, I have to add here, it's important to note that uh, the president uh, or the USTR uh, decided to use U.S. trade law rather than the World Trade Organization or the WTO uh, mechanisms, uh, which had been used very aggressively by the Obama administration and by uh, the Bush administration. And the reason that uh, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, of USTR decided to do that was uh, he felt, uh, and I think that uh, the president felt, uh, that the traditional uh, disciplines within the WTO were insufficient uh, to uh, uh, to resolve uh, the issues that uh, we faced uh, with China. And uh, the feeling within USTR was that previous administrations had gone the multilateral route uh, and had failed, and that uh, therefore uh, the Trump administration would go uh, the bilateral route. Um, and so the 301 investigation uh, came, uh, was, a, uh, I think, a, a good report, uh, I think an excellent report that accurately uh, described uh, China's trade practices in a number of different areas, uh, and then uh, ascribed uh, damages um, uh, that resulted uh, from those areas. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'm happy to um, in Q&A. Uh, but the major chapters of the 301 report uh, are uh, intellectual property right violations by Chinese, which reduce those royalties paid to North Carolina or other com American companies, subsidies by the Chinese government uh, that uh, would have, that would result in overcapacity and uh, have an impact, either direct or, or indirect, on, uh, on trade. 
market access uh, in a number of different areas. Uh, the Chinese government has not lived up to its WTO obligations, and uh, USTR looked at that very, uh, very carefully and described uh, the issues uh, in a number of different industries, one of which was financial services. Uh, Charlotte has a great financial services industry, uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that you benefited as a result of the phase one deal. I'll, I'll get to that in a few seconds. Another um, area of focus within uh, the 301 was state-owned enterprises. The fact that China has a socialist economy with a very large state-owned sector is, I think, ipso facto uh, a, a, a restraint on trade. Uh, and uh, it was addressed uh, within the report. Uh, market access for agriculture was addressed, and I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Technology policy is a big one uh, that was addressed, and that, there's a clear overlay with subsidies and state-owned enterprises on that one. And then uh, last but certainly not least is cyber policy. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, the, that's multifaceted, that Facebook and, and Google are not able to operate in China, but also that there has been uh, intellectual property theft through, um, uh, through cyber espionage uh, for commercial gain. Um, so those are, uh, were the major uh, subjects that were addressed in uh, the 301. And uh, this report led to a series of negotiations which were on again, off again, in the early part of the administration, um, but in the hope that a quick ag agreement could be reached. But this uh, proved elusive. Uh, so President Trump uh, became tariff man uh, and imposed a series of tariffs on Chinese exports or US imports. And at first, uh, these tariffs were uh, on only a small subset of Chinese manufactured goods, mostly industrial parts, uh, material supplies, that really didn't touch uh, the consumer goods sector. It wasn't shoes or, or clothing or sporting goods, uh, but rather in the on the industrial side. The Chinese responded immediately by imposing tariffs on their own, of their own on US imports, roughly in equal measure. So uh, these negotiations were on again, off again. And as uh, they went off again, uh, the president raised uh, the tariffs and included more goods uh, in uh, uh, the tariffs, uh, such that uh, about 75% of Chinese imports and an equal number of American imports into China were covered by tariffs ranging from 10 uh, to 25%. Um, and in November of last year, the president threatened uh, to impose 25% tariffs on all Chinese imports. Uh, and the day before uh, that deadline uh, of December uh, 15th was reached, uh, uh, a, a partial agreement was announced and further tariff increases uh, were uh, postponed. Now that uh, deal, which we call uh, the phase one deal, uh, went into effect, uh, it was signed, uh, uh, didn't go into effect, it was signed by President Trump uh, in the East Wing um, uh, on uh, January 15th, effective a month later, February 14th. Um, now this was not the deal that President Trump wanted. Uh, rather, it was a partial deal that addressed only some of the problems that we have with China that I mentioned before, mentioned under the 301. And that's why it's called the phase one deal. And it was very explicit uh, that there would be a second round of negotiations. Um, but the deal touches uh, upon um, and at least partially resolves uh, a, a number of the agenda items that I mentioned before. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, that a number of these items, particularly intellectual property rights, agricultural uh, uh, market access, and financial service market access have been uh, all, uh, if not fully resolved, then very significantly move forward. 
What has not been resolved uh, is more core to the Chinese Communist Party's uh, kind of socio-political control and uh, their whole raison d'etre, if you will. Uh, and that would include uh, subsidies, uh, technology policy, state-owned enterprises, and uh, cyber. Uh, and so these issues were pushed off uh, to the so-called uh, phase two deal, which has not yet happened. I'll, I'll get back to that uh, in, about, uh, in about three to four minutes. Um, so, uh, uh, so the phase one deal covered some very important territory, all of which is important to North Carolinians. I would say that the most important is the agriculture. Um, the agriculture deal, I, I won't go into it in detail. Uh, I could, but uh, I'll spare you uh, that. But the most important part for North Carolina uh, is that it really opens up animal protein exports uh, from the United States to China so that the soybeans we produce can be consumed here by our hogs or chicken or beef uh, and then shipped uh, to China as, uh, as frozen, uh, frozen meat. And we've seen a huge uptick in, in Chinese uh, uh, meat exports uh, uh, since the deal was signed. And I think that that is a really important structural uh, success. On the intellectual property rights side, uh, I noted before with, with uh, the services income that North Carolina has a lot of good inventors and a lot of good intellectual property. Uh, and uh, I am hopeful that you're gonna see a good uptick there as a result of the IPR uh, agreement. Uh, uh, that'll be something that I'll watch for eagerly. Um, in the 2020 uh, 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 numbers once they're finalized. And finally, financial services, uh, particularly in Charlotte, uh, you should be uh, pleased with the financial services accord. All of my member companies are very happy with it. Uh, we've had probably two dozen major um, approvals given to uh, American uh, financial services company. And recall uh, how that China's 20% um, of the world's population has probably 40% of world savings. And so for uh, Charlotte uh, and other North Carolina uh, financial services companies, th this is the, a big kahuna. Uh, and uh, it uh, has uh, been uh, largely open. So in the phase one agreement, uh, there was a second chapter, a second part. And that has uh, to do with uh, the trade imbalance. Uh, President Trump uh, very much wanted to directly address the trade imbalance. And therefore, uh, he insisted that uh, targets be put in place uh, for increases in US exports uh, in four different areas. Um, and they are uh, agriculture, manufacturing, energy, and services. And uh, the basic concept behind this, uh, if you will, it's pretty non-traditional, it, it's pretty innovative uh, approach uh, is that U.S. exports should double uh, between uh, 2020, uh, 2021 and 2022. In other words, uh, a 40 percent increase in 2020 exports and then on top of that a 40 percent increase in 2022 exports in the four areas that I mentioned. Now, this part of the agreement is uh, less successful. And uh, certainly COVID uh, plays an important uh, role in that. Um, I would note uh, that there's different degrees of success uh, within uh, the four industry areas. And among them, agriculture is by far the best. And I noted earlier about, um, uh, about animal protein uh, going to China. And uh, I, th I think that that's a wave of the future that North Carolina farmers can bank on. Um, uh, and so I think that, but, but even so, uh, the Chinese are behind their targets, their agreed to targets in 2020 uh, for uh, uh, imports of American agricultural goods. Now, the year's not uh, finished, 
And uh, this is the best of the four categories. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to be skeptical that the Chinese will be able uh, to get there in part uh, because of uh, COVID. Um, when we look at manufacturing, uh, uh, I think it's more difficult uh, even. Uh, the Chinese have, uh, the numbers uh, vary, but have probably not exceeded thus far in the year 40% uh, of, of their commitments. Uh, a lot of that has to do with aircraft. Uh, and because of the 737 uh, MAX uh, issues, um, it's been hard uh, for the Chinese uh, to meet uh, uh, their expectations and, and their wishes there. And, and I think that those uh, sales are, if you will, piling up. And it's not too late for the Chinese to meet their commitments, but it's becoming more difficult. Energy is even more difficult. And the major reason for that is, is not really, uh, if you will, the will of, of anybody. It's not ill will or bad faith. It's that energy prices are very low. Uh, and uh, there's relatively little storage uh, capability in China or in, indeed anywhere. But what the Chinese have done to meet their commitments is they've uh, uh, transferred some of their purchasing uh, from long-term deals in Saudi Arabia to us. And thus there's quite a bit of, uh, there's a large stream of American LNG and crude uh, going to China. Also coal, uh, less coal, uh, that's something I worry about. Uh, but uh, uh, there is uh, quite a bit of energy exports going to China. But even with, they're not at the volume that they need to be. But even if they were, they're uh, way below target because of the value. And uh, I think that they recognize uh, that problem. Now, services is even a more difficult area. And I think that uh, there are three reasons for that, COVID, COVID, and COVID. Um, a large part of uh, the services exports, as I noted in, in the slides, were really travel and tourism. Uh, and uh, there is no travel and, or tourism. And uh, so they're really getting further and further behind here. And uh, depending on what happens <coughs> with the virus, it, it, uh, it, it's difficult for me uh, to see how this uh, will end up. So uh, how do you, you evaluate the phase one agreement? Well, um, glass half empty, glass half full. Um, it, it, you know, the structural or policy commitments are being implemented faithfully. Uh, the purchase commitments uh, have not. Uh, is that a result of COVID or something else? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, different people, reasonable people, could draw different conclusions. So what's next? <clears throat> um, I think that uh, USTR really did a great job uh, in negotiating the phase one agreement. And this is literally the only area of the relationship uh, that is uh, productive, uh, smooth, uh, collaborative. Uh, and uh, thus, I think that either uh, a Biden administration or, or uh, a Trump II administration would probably want to keep it. Um, I think that if you were to look at a, a Biden administration, uh, that they would be uh, more uh, anxious uh, to get rid of those tariffs uh, than a Trump administration. Uh, 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 Biden would be a much more reluctant use of, uh, user of tariffs overall. Uh, but in either case, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to move uh, forward with the phase two discussions. Uh, and again, those would focus on subsidies, technology policy, state-owned enterprises, and cyber. Now, these discussions will not be easy, and it's not going to be possible to reach a state of perfection or nirvana or dying and going to heaven. That's not going to happen. Um, but uh, it is possible to make incremental progress in these areas. And I am hopeful with incremental progress and a roadmap for addressing these same issues, uh, uh, preferably with allies, friends, and partners and in the WTO context, uh, that uh, we would be able to make um, uh, further progress. Um, so I think that uh, actually the, the options on the menu for a Trump administration or a Biden administration are not that different. 
uh, and uh, I think that the likely uh, approach by the two would be uh, different at the margin, but not uh, that radically different. Now, um, before ending, I, I should note that, uh, at least in my view, really the central uh, debate, the central problem, the central issue that we have with China is, uh, in a word, technology. Um, and uh, within the U.S. context, uh, the Trump administration has taken, you know, many, many measures uh, from export controls to investment controls uh, to prosecutions to rules and regulations uh, to executive orders against TikTok and WeChat, um, uh, visa refusals, prosecutions um, to to try to address. Uh, uh, perceptions uh, that uh, Chinese are, are have in the past uh, stolen U.S. technology and are putting it to commercial uh, use. Um, now, uh, I uh, again, I don't think that this is going to change radically uh, with a Trump or a Biden administration. Uh, uh, I do think that there will be changes at the margin, um, uh, but I'm hopeful uh, that. Um, uh, that that the approach would include more uh, a domestic look at uh, our manufacturing capabilities, a domestic look at making the United States uh, a better place for semiconductor manufacturers or PPE manufacturers, uh, for, for instance, uh, to bring back supply chains home, uh, to avoid a single po point of failure in supply chains, uh, and to ensure uh, that, uh, that uh, U.S. Uh, industry uh, and manufacturing is safe, sound, and healthy. So let me conclude by saying that uh, Larry Summers at, at one point uh, said that uh, China uh, was a, China's emergence into the global economy uh, was the most important event, uh, economic event of the 20th century. And, and I agree with Larry Summers on that. Um, uh, you know, you could argue maybe it was the internet, uh, but it's of that, uh, of that level of importance. And I would like to uh, uh, add a coda onto that, uh, that uh, the rivalry between China, uh, between China and the United States in the 21st century is probably the most uh, single important econ economic event of our children and our, child uh, our grandchildren's uh, lifetimes. And uh, we better get it right. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ambassador. This was very enlightening. And let me introduce to you Firoz Fira, a board member of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte Firoz. Yes, Ambassador, that was uh, most informative. Um, I really like the specifics. And we have uh, questions for you, obviously. Great. Uh, let me ask you the first one. Um, it's from Anonymous, uh, who is assuming that there will be a change in administration. And based on that, if that were to happen, uh, what do you see the change in the broader US-China relationships? You know, there are many aspects of it that you talked about, but at the higher level, do you see a change in tone and, um, you know, back to shaking hands when we can and so on? Well, thank you for the question. I, I did focus really on trade uh, in North Carolina be because Ray Dalio is going to be doing that as well. But let me uh, take a couple of seconds and talk about the overall relationship. I think that um, uh, this is not going to be uh, Obama 3.0. Uh, there has been a permanent shift. Um, and uh, I would argue uh, that uh, the incoming uh, Biden foreign policy team, uh, defense team, uh, and trade team uh, would all accept that uh, we are in a more permanent uh, competitive uh, relationship with China. And they will argue, as I would argue, uh, that China has changed. Uh, and uh, that the, we need to deal with the China that we see uh, rather than the one that we uh, wish for. Um, and um, there are several elements of that. Um, firstly, uh, the geopolitics uh, 
especially with regard uh, to Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea, uh, put us in uh, uh, a position of, of rivalry and, and competition that we're just not going to be able to get out of. And that's not new, but uh, the tempo is new. And uh, it is not resolved, and I don't expect it to be resolved uh, within uh, the next 10 years. Um, the other element uh, is uh, that China has, uh, uh, and, and my Chinese friends will agree, uh, has changed. Uh, the state is playing a more important role. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, has uh, centralized power. Uh, the use of ideology is much, much greater uh, than it has been in the past. Uh, and uh, the domestic conditions uh, within China uh, from a human rights or, if, if you will, what the Chinese call minority issues, uh, uh, be it Tibet uh, or Xinjiang uh, or, and others, uh, are uh, much more complex and, and painful now uh, than they were in the past. And uh, I think that uh, we need to recognize that policy. I think that what will change, so there will be continuity within uh, a Biden administration, both on the geopolitical and on the technology side. Uh, what will change is uh, the approach. And uh, by that, I, I just emphasize uh, and underline and underscore and bold uh, that uh, the Trump administration will want to look at this issue and other uh, uh, China in particular, but other challenges as well in the context of collaboration with our allies, friends, and partners around the world, and in the context of uh, uh, global institutions and commitments to those institutions uh, and a rule, global rules-based order. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, once, uh, if there is a Biden administration on, on uh, January 20, and I would agree that there almost certainly will be, uh, that uh, it will not reach out to China first, it'll reach out to our friends and allies uh, and say, uh, uh, where can we work together uh, on these issues? Uh, let us uh, uh, cooperate in accordance uh, to our, our common uh, values, uh, uh, laws, and frameworks. And uh, the approach to China will be much less bilateral confrontation and much more um, uh, as a part uh, of, a, of a broader team. Now, that's easy to say, but it's actually very difficult to do. Uh, the Europeans are not going to welcome us back unconditionally. The Europeans have uh, a lot of complaints about us. The Japanese and the Koreans uh, do as well. Uh, are we willing to compromise on issues important to them uh, to get to that place? And I think that, that that's a discussion that will be had over the next uh, two months, two or three months. Uh, and I don't think it's easy uh, because uh, compromising with the Europeans uh, would affect U.S. interests, and I have no doubt. Uh, that those interests will uh, not be happy. Uh, but to have uh, uh, a collaborative, coordinated effort with Europe, Japan, and, and Korea, there's going to have to be uh, some significant changes uh, from uh, the policies of the current administration. And those changes uh, will be costly uh, and painful. Uh, are they changes that we are willing to make? Well, let's talk again in about three or four months. Okay, I have another question here. One of the uh, drivers for the trade war that began uh, with tariffs and so on uh, was obviously the intent by the administration to reduce the trade deficit overall uh, between us and the rest of the world, but especially China. And uh, yet, and, and actually President Trump campaigned on that also to, to reduce that. But the numbers that we saw in August this year, just a couple of months ago, uh, in terms of trade deficit, were the, the highest ever right. deficit. So nothing has really happened. If from your perspective, 
what should be done to reduce the trade deficit uh, or should we not worry about it? Well, um, I, I come at this from an economics uh, 101 point of view. And the macroeconomics of this uh, suggests uh, those countries that oversave, like China, are going to have a trade surplus. Those countries that undersave, like the United States, are going to have a trade deficit. And uh, to the extent that you undersave, your deficit is going to be larger. To the extent that you oversave, uh, your surplus is going to be larger. And uh, the overall bilateral, uh, and indeed multi bilateral trade uh, uh, deficits are uh, irrelevant uh, from an economist's uh, point of view. And uh, uh, multilateral trade imbalances reflect the imbalance between savings, investment, and consumption. And in the United States, we're great at consumption, uh, for sure. Uh, but our savings rates are, 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 are lacking. Um, and I think that the other, um, uh, the obverse of that is true. As a diplomat, uh, I worked very hard uh, to try to reduce Chinese excess savings uh, in a number of ways, uh, to introduce credit cards, uh, to um, uh, uh, help uh, the welfare state to guarantee pensions and medical care and education care so that people didn't have to oversave uh, for that. Uh, and I think that really that's where the answer lies, is uh, getting the Chinese uh, to address uh, some of the problems within their social um, uh, welfare system, which forces individuals to save because they can't trust the state to take care of them in their old age or, or their kids' uh, welfare or their medical expenses. So I think that uh, the other element of that, of course, is our own uh, not so great record at savings. Now that said, uh, we ought to go after the Chinese with a ton of bricks uh, if they are not meeting their WTO obligations or other bilateral obligations. Now I'm not letting them off the hook for one second, uh, but I think that, uh, to be honest uh, with ourselves, that the problem primarily lies uh, with our own macroeconomic imbalances that must be addressed. Uh, and COVID has sent our, um, our uh, budget deficit reeling in the wrong direction. And you could see that in the numbers, the import numbers. Our trade imbalance has exploded over the last few months as a result of uh, that much needed fiscal stimulus, uh, uh, despite the fact uh, that the US dollar is weakening. Um, so ultimately at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, in my view, uh, if the trade deficit goes from, uh, 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 the trade surplus goes from uh, China and it's uh, transferred over to Vietnam, it doesn't help a single American and I don't care. Uh, what I do care about is the overall level of uh, the trade deficit and how it impacts uh, American companies and American workers, farmers and ranchers' ability to compete in the global economy. And uh, uh, I know that we could do that uh, and we could do a better job at that. Uh, what I would care about is trying to double the number of uh, North Carolina workers whose jobs depend, whose good jobs depend on uh, exports uh, to China. I think that that's an achievable, uh, uh, I won't say inevitable, but an achievable objective o over the next five years, uh, particularly if we could write the bilateral relationship. Thank you. Um, uh, next question, uh, I have two questions from Chase Saunders and I'm going to combine them somewhat uh, because the first one talks about uh, the fact that we let uh, China into the WTO, we were you know, encouraging them to do so and we approved them, uh, but uh, didn't foresee that uh, they were going to eat our cake. Uh, we kept an open door policy so that uh, the GDP of, in China went up by $12 trillion in over 20 years, uh, which showed that we weren't quite ready for the consequences of seeing all the movement of manufacturing and today we are now seeing our financial services companies going there, uh, helping the Chinese develop their capital markets. 
And I guess the question is about, are we likely to, you know, end up in the same situation from a financial services perspective if we are so forthcoming in helping and don't realize the long-term negative impact on ourselves? Uh, well, your thoughts on that? Well, let me, let me uh, be very candid uh, here and say that uh, Chinese GDP uh, per capita went from $190 a year uh, to about, uh, you know, uh, between eleven and $14,000 a year, depending on PPP and exchange rate, et cetera, um, over the course of 40 years. And uh, I wouldn't uh, 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 suggest that uh, uh, Americans should take any credit for that at all as a, as a result of very hard work by uh, 1.4 billion Chinese people, 20% of the world's population. Um, and I think that if you fast forward, uh, uh, even assuming a uh, r relatively low 3% economic growth, uh, China's GDP will overtake that of the United States uh, in a few years uh, and uh, then double that of the United States uh, in 15 to 20 years. Uh, and uh, I would say that that is not inevitable, uh, but uh, we want a strong, stable, prosperous China that plays by the rules. And having a middle class uh, uh, consumer market of 600 million people uh, in China is a great thing uh, for, for, for us uh, if uh, we have uh, fair access to that. So uh, allowing uh, China into the WTO, uh, at least in my view, uh, was inevitable. When we look at this from a longer term historic perspective, uh, China has been uh, the leading economy on earth uh, since the Han Dynasty 3,000 years ago. Uh, and China will probably be the largest economy on Earth for the greater part of uh, this century, uh, uh, from a few years from now. And is that not inevitable uh, if they have 20% of the world's population? So the question of how do we deal with that? How do we, how do we, what is the right policy mix to address that reality, I think is very complex, very difficult. Let me rephrase the question. Um, how does one deal with a country that is both your largest overseas market, your largest overseas supplier, one that is an ideological rival, uh, and one uh, that is a geostrategic rival? Um, and one that, that uh, where we share incredible interdependencies uh, with. How do you deal with that? Well, that's the problem set that we have in front of us. And it's a very difficult problem set. Uh, my own uh, personal uh, preference is to embrace allies, uh, embrace uh, the multilateral inst institutions, demand uh, that China live up to all of its commitments, bilateral and multilateral, and uh, work within the context of uh, CPTPP uh, or other WTO uh, uh, kind of offshoots or children, if you will, uh, to uh, uh, help to try to raise the Chinese game. Now, I realize that that's a long-term um, uh, prospect and it's gonna be really difficult but I think that that option is better than any other. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that conflict uh, with China uh, is, uh, could uh, lead, uh, uh, is unthinkable uh, given uh, the nuclear stance of both countries. So we have no choice, no choice, but to figure this out. Great, thank you. No, you, you highlighted some um, uh, realities of, uh, uh, the two countries and uh, the scale that China is achieving so quickly. Uh, I'd like to narrow down back to North Carolina. Uh, earlier, you talked a great deal about um, uh, how well or where North Carolina was positioned in terms of uh, export and imports uh, with China and that we were doing reasonably well and could do so much yeah. better. How do we compare to our surrounding states, um, which are in you know the similar... Locale geographically have uh, similar perhaps industrial or 
commercial structures. Can you give us some comparison? You know, I, I, I'm not able to do that uh, with regard to uh, neighboring states. Uh, uh, but what I would note is that uh, in 2019, uh, 2018, 2019, and, and 2020, really uh, it's the agricultural, uh, the grain uh, uh, producing states that have really taken it on the chin. Uh, Iowa, for example, uh, which really exports uh, uh, relatively few commodities, um, saw their exports decline by 50% to China. And uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, also, uh, not completely, not as much as Iowa, reliant on uh, a agriculture. Um, I, I would say that the, the pain as a result of the, the trade tensions is not only felt it by exporters. There have been many importers, uh, particularly manufacturing companies, uh, that have relied on parts, supplies, materials uh, from China uh, uh, to go into their manufacturing process, which is then sold either in the US or, or in the US and exported. And uh, part of the manufacturing recession uh, and U.S. manufacturing numbers have been in decline for the last two years, uh, is a result of the tariffs. And it's different, diff difficult to parse out the uh, import tariffs and the export tariff, which is caused by which. Uh, but uh, put them both together, uh, and both the manufacturing economy and the agricultural e economy, not services and energy, have both been negatively impacted. And I, I know that a lot of small uh, North Carolina manufacturers have uh, been impacted or been forced to uh, adjust their supply chains uh, <clears throat> because of the import tariffs. And they have been very destructive uh, depending on how much, uh, how reliant you were on the Chinese imports. But that's very difficult to quantify. Uh, and I've heard uh, that the number of 170,000 manufacturing jobs uh, have been lost uh, as a result of the tariffs. Uh, but the other problem there is that you have steel tariffs, aluminum tariffs, and, and the, three, the China tariffs. And again, how do you parse that out? Uh, uh, it becomes very uh, complex. Uh, but uh, uh, I do know uh, that uh, were we to find some form of a phase one agreement, uh, that, uh, that there would be a uh, profoundly uh, big impact on most manufacturers, uh, most farmers, uh, and it would also benefit American consumers. Uh, but I would ar also argue that we need to take care of those fundamental issues within the Chinese economy and now is as good a time as we're ever going to have uh, to do so. So we should really buckle down and get this done and uh, get to a normal trading situation as soon as possible. Great. Thank you very much. In fact, you generated so much interest. I've got questions still coming in, but we've uh, run out of time. So over to you, Lubomir and Wayne. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ambassador. Um, Wayne Cooper, the board chair. Wayne. I can't get it there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for an excellent, excellent presentation. It's so timely with everything that's happening in the, in the world today. As LJ always says, if you're not a member, please join and become a member. And I noticed, and if you are a member, think about upgrading your membership. This will help LJ and the staff bring great programs like we just heard tonight. And we hope that everybody will have a great week and, and enjoy it. And LJ, I think we need to talk about the uh, World Quest, is that? Yes, on Thursday we have World Quest. It's going to be a competition of global knowledge. We're sold out, but you can still join us and, and participate by uh, watching it. Uh, so please let us know if you're interested this Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, please join us for the World Quest. If you want to join the China Town Hall conversation at 7 p.m., you can live stream it directly. There's a link in our chat box, and please do so. Ambassador, we would love to have you come to Charlotte. When the time allows and the condition allows, uh, this was magnificent. 
Um, and thank you so very much for all you're doing. It is such an important relationship. It is beyond strategic. And um, we really appreciate you being with us here tonight. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in Charlotte just as soon as possible. Thank you. So. Thank you so much. Thanks. Pleasure.